Hello everyone and welcome to today's NOCO webinar, Big Data Analytics in Transportation Systems Management and Operations. My name is Nilu Parvinashtiani and I will help facilitate today's webinar. Today's webinar is hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence or NOCO. So if you don't already, NOCO offers uh, resources for the TISMO community. There are a few ways you can connect with us and use our resources. So if you look at the right side of your screen, there is a tab with uh, the title useful links. So that is four ways you can keep in touch with, with us. So first of all is our knowledge center. There are um, hundreds of publications, different resources, uh, webinars, peer exchange for sittings, on the topic of TISMO is shared there with you on our website. Also, if you want to get notified whenever there is a new webinar recording, you can subscribe to NOCO YouTube channel and uh, keep in touch with us, uh, especially with the webinar program. And also, uh, with the NOCO newsletter that goes out bi-weekly, you can get uh, the most uh, newest and most exciting uh, industry in TISMO news and especially our upcoming webinars. Many of you or maybe already uh, subscribed to that and have gotten to know of this webinar through that. And finally, if you want to be more uh, in touch with us in real time, subscri subscribe to us on the Twitter. Um, so you can download today's slides directly from here, the download slides part. This is available at the beginning uh, when I'm doing this intro and also at the end of the webinar during Q&A. Uh, other than this, we are recording this webinar and that webinar recording along with the presentation slides will be shared uh, with you through the NOCO website. Uh, as well as a follow-up email that will be sent to you after the webinar, letting you know that the uh, recording and the slides are available. Um, so, uh, also like make sure to check out our future webinars. You can directly like go to them right now by clicking uh, through those click here links that I've shared with you. So let me cover a few logistics before I go through the agenda on our speakers today. Uh, so you, all the participants are muted by default, but uh, we encourage them to put in their questions in the question discussion pod anytime during the webinar as the questions uh, come to their mind. So at the end of the webinar, those questions will be read out loud and uh, will be answered by our presenters today. So let me go quickly over the, today's agenda and the presenters. I have asked the presenters to briefly introduce themselves before their presentation, but their full bios are available on NOCO webpage, so please refer to those to learn more about our speakers today. Uh, so the first uh, presentation uh, and first part of the webinar uh, we will have Bob McQueen from Bob McQueen and Associates uh, who will go over his slides on TISMO from an, an analytics perspective. And after that, we will have Petros uh, Zantopoulos from Stetson University covering predictive and perspective analytics in TISMO. So after those two presentations, we have saved some time for Q&A, so please, uh, participate, uh, just put in any comments or questions you have. Um, so that is all I have, and with that, I'll hand it over to Bob to start us off with the webinar. Thank you very much, Nilo. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob McQueen. I'm a CEO for Bob McQueen Associates. Uh, despite my Scottish accent, I live in Orlando in Florida and uh, I specialize in the application of advanced technology to transportation, intelligent transportation systems, and uh, also big data and analytics. Uh, most recently, I've been focusing on applying big data and analytics into uh, uh, transportation agencies and smart cities. So, uh, so 
go on to the next slide here. If, if you use the arrows at the bottom, you can change them yourself. Yep, I'm clicking on the arrow and nothing is happening. Oh, so let me do the first one. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Oh, there it's working. Thank you. So the today's topics, uh, we're going to review some instructional objectives to, to guide the content. Uh, uh, give some information on what you can expect. Then we'll talk a little bit about transfer system, transportation systems management and operations, TSM and all. And uh, <clears throat> we may have a slightly wider view uh, than, than some people in the audience, so we just wanted to share that with you. And then we'll look at it from an analytics perspective. Uh, then uh, Petros will discuss predictive and uh, descriptive analytics uh, and machine learning and, and big data and how it can be useful to TSM and all. And we'll summarize, and uh, we're hoping to leave about 20 minutes for discussion. So in terms of what we're trying to achieve, Bob, your sound is breaking. Are you having issues with audio? I apologize with about this. I think we are having some issues hearing Bob. Uh, I'm working here with him to see how we can resolve this. So um, again, uh, I apologize for this. I think Bob is having some issues. Um, meanwhile, I don't know Petrus if you would feel comfortable, uh, you know, starting some of the parts you're covering, and then I'll resolve the issues with Bob. Petrus, do you hear? Can you hear me? Because I cannot hear you. Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I, ca I can go over my presentation. Okay, yeah, that would be great. All right. So, basically, yeah, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, my name is uh, Petros Anthopoulos and um, I am with uh, Stetson University. Uh, decision and information science department with the School of Business and um, basically my background is in um, uh, computers uh, you know applied uh, to uh, solving everyday problems and uh, methods for data analysis including statistics and, uh, and databases so basically we've started collaborating with with Bob and uh, you know in, in the application of big data uh, in uh, smart cities in connected vehicles so basically this seminar is part of uh, uh, this collaboration so here in my presentation I'm planning to uh, uh, basically go over uh, some of the uh, uh, most common methods for analyzing data how did this analytics thing uh, you know uh, started what does it mean uh, how is defined and uh, give you some examples not necessarily coming from transportation but you know from uh, areas uh, other you know that I'm familiar with what what analytics have done for for other uh, areas and then talk brief, briefly about how uh, data has exploded and how uh, uh, Internet of Things is growing and, and what does it mean for for us like and uh, uh, how that translates into opportunities so over here this is a uh, 
basically a brief overview of analytics. So there are uh, three branches or three main categories. There are the descriptive analytics, uh, the predictive and the prescriptive. So basically these branches are uh, self uh, self-explanatory so the descriptive is when we basically uh, do a preliminary analysis of data with uh, the purpose of maybe visualizing or uh, summarizing the data and providing some uh, numbers or some uh, maps that basically can allow us to detect some trends uh, however with the descriptive analytics, we do not necessarily uh, uh, making any prediction or making some recommendation or so. So whenever we have a, a dashboard of metrics, for example, or uh, you know a map uh, uh, with with different colors or some numbers that they summarize a big uh, data set or a histogram or whatever you know uh, these visual visual tools, this this falls under descriptive analytics, right? And then we have the predictive analytics which basically over there we take a step further and we're not just describing a data set but we're actually uh, predicting uh, we're predicting a structure or we're predicting some uh, you know future uh, behavior of our system and this is uh, part of understanding like the trends and how to use the trends in order to understand future or uh, you know underlying structure that is not uh, very obvious and last one is the prescriptive, which over there we actually tell the decision maker what has to be done, right? So everything that uh, provides uh, with, with a recommendation, with a decision that actually can be implemented and deployed, and then it can be measurable. Uh, it has a measurable outcomes. You know, it falls under uh, the, the prescriptive category. Uh, and I have an, a definition here of what is analytics and this is by the institute of operations research and, Man and management science the informs uh, which is a major uh, a professional society that uh, uh, a lot of um, quantitative people and mathematicians statisticians and, and, and business uh, operations uh, people uh, uh, get together to study these problems uh, so they came up with the inform uh, with the with the definition that uh, analytics is the scientific process of transforming data into insights for the purpose of making better decisions. So the key words here is that we use science, we use quantitative methods, and the goal is to take data, uh, look at the insights, and finally make uh, decisions. Right. So this is, uh, these are the four uh, key terms of on the definition of analytics, and this is how we. Uh, uh, we, we, we define them and it's a very general uh, definition so that includes methods for a lot of sciences including statistics operations research computer science it includes both the mathematics uh, the technology uh, uh, the sensors so it's a it's a multidisciplinary uh, area right uh, so here I want to start going over some examples so when we talk about descriptive analytics uh, maybe if you have if you remember some of your stat classes uh, you might remember the term descriptive statistics which basically refers to the uh, uh, the summarization of data so when we have data and we calculate a number like the mean on the standard deviation that's a descriptive statistic where when we talk descriptive analytics it goes beyond that right so it doesn't it includes all the descriptive statistics but also in, includes a lot of things that they're not under uh, the descriptive statistics and one of these things is the uh, visualizations so here I want to show you and talk about uh, an example uh, of how we can actually sense uh, the traffic and how busy the city is during the day by just looking at social media right uh, so I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with four squares if if you're not uh, that's okay it's all about um, a, a social a media platform that allows uh, users to check into different places like restaurants nightclubs uh, uh, gyms work everything and uh, basically they, they collect some points similar to ways that pretty much they are not useful for anything except for that the platform is collecting data about uh, the user uh, behavior patterns right so if we take this information and we put it on a map uh, this is very 
very useful in understanding you know the flow of the crowd within the city and without deploying any kind of particular sensors we can actually see what parts of city are busy how people move around when they go to uh, you know places like uh, uh, restaurants and uh, after work and when do they go to the nightclubs and when the, the city is busier and when it's less busy and so on and so forth so here there is a video showing just the uh, check-ins of uh, Foursquare within 24 hours within one uh, calendar uh, day in New York in, in the Manhattan Island and, and the suburbs uh, of New York so uh, here I'm gonna need uh, to ask for Nilu to help me with the video so on the on the left hand side you can see the different colors you can see we have residential uh, food arts and entertainment um, university sports so uh, here um, uh, I can see the video um, in uh, from from Nilo's computer so if if we play the video you can see that the different colors change you know from a neighborhood to neighborhood and that gives basically an idea of how uh, you know the city breathes and uh, uh, and uh, uh, basically um, uh, okay so if if you maximize maybe you can play one more time the video just to so okay that's a difference it that's Tokyo the same idea again you can see all the road networks um, all the major hubs where people go for food and uh, again and, and basically with a zero infrastructure just by plotting one dot for every user for every time that they do uh, check-in you can uh, see you know what's busy and what's not right uh, all right so I think uh, I think that's um, that's enough we can we can uh, turn it off thanks Nilo and uh, all right and we can go back to the presentation yeah so basically this is an example of descriptive analytics where although we don't do any statistics we don't do any math we just have a map and we put a colorful dot for every action we end up getting the, the trends and the and, and the idea of how the city uh, moves right uh, the second the second example is an example of predictive analytics and over here I've chosen to uh, uh, this uh, described an example that uh, it's it's not related at all to transportation but just to show you what uh, insights have analytics provided to other areas uh, okay I see here a comment that uh, some people were not able to see the preview slides so uh, maybe uh, later when the sites will be posted uh, th there is a link yeah Nilu maybe you can send the link so people can actually uh, run uh, the, the, the video on their computers yeah uh, all right. So, with respect to uh, predictive analytics, one uh, one er one uh, area is, is called clustering, right? In clustering, we have data, and we want to uh, group, you know, the data by categories. So, basically, we want algorithms to uh, be able to uh, put together uh, data points that they are similar, and that is that serves as, uh, uh, for example, as an exploratory or preliminary analysis of the data. And by understanding the structure of the data, like the group, uh, uh, the, the the group of uh, uh, of data that they're all together, uh, this you know it can uh, uh, actually give us information about the underlying structure of uh, of the problem, right? So here, what I did is that I basically went ahead and I created. Uh, my graph uh, on LinkedIn so everybody I guess has a, a, a map on LinkedIn and uh, what you can do is that uh, every person who is connected to you appears as a dot on the graph uh, and when two people are friends with each other then you can connect them with with the net 
right? So if you do that, if you plot all the people and you see that the names are minimized and uh, and the uh, and there are edges between people who are also uh, friends on LinkedIn, uh, you start seeing some structures. So if you run a clustering algorithm, you can see that there are some more dense uh, structures in my LinkedIn network. And beforehand, I'm not able, I, I, I really don't know what kind of groups I'm going to see. But after seeing the grouping, I can see that, for example, there is a group of uh, uh, the places that uh, I went for grad school at University of Florida. So there is one group of uh, the undergraduate students at, that I use, um, uh, I, I taught classes to when I was at UF. Uh, there is another group of, uh, of of graduate colleagues from UF, and then there is a third group of from University of Central Florida because I, I worked there for five years, and the people uh, uh, that I'm associated uh, there they form a, a, a third cluster, right? And then you can see a smaller cluster uh, which is my current colleagues and uh, faculty and staff from Stetson University, obviously smaller than the previous ones because of the size of the institution. And finally, there is a, a large, uh, less connected uh, cluster on the bottom, which are my uh, uh, friends and classmates from my uh, undergraduate institution. Uh, so you can see that just by plotting the network and running a clustering, this is basically a, a weight-based um, uh, a algorithm where uh, basically the algorithm plots um, uh, people who have common uh, acquaintances uh, pretty close and then eventually grouping the different uh, items you know uh, based on their closeness uh, you can see the structure of uh, of your network right so this is basically uh, an algorithm that predicts you know your your clusters and this is basically uh, one example where you can identify users that they share some common characteristics. Uh, these methods are also used in uh, recommender systems or when you have, for example, a group of clients. Like for, uh, for example, if you have a bike sharing pro uh, program, right, and you have people that they use your bikes and you might want to find what are the major uh, groups of individuals that they are users of your system, right? You want to see you have the people who go to work, the people who are like old, young, and, you know, the ones that they use it for recreation uh, versus the one that they clearly use it just to, you know, go to their office and back home. Uh, so basically clustering can serve uh, as a method to, uh, to solve such kind of problems. And, and then uh, we, uh, we have the uh, group of uh, uh, prescriptive analytics, which is basically, as I told you, it's uh, all the methodologies that you take the data and you don't just predict some structure, you don't just uh, create some uh, pretty visualization, but you actually um, uh, take some actions, you tell your organization what to do, you put these actions in practice and you actually uh, go back and see if you know what you did was, uh, was any useful. So the example here that I chose to uh, to show you is coming from entertainment industry. It's coming from uh, uh, Netflix and the show House of Cards. So I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with this show. Which uh, 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 right, it has been successful for several um, uh, seasons, and right now it's not uh, as successful, but not for reasons that have to do with with the data. Uh, however, here I want to tell you how Netflix came with the idea of putting together a show and how did they decide on, uh, you know, the uh, leading actors and, uh, and and the directors of the show, right? So, what they did was basically back in the day when when they decided to uh, have their first uh, uh, Netflix original uh, production, and uh, Netflix uh, had 27 million subscribers and in the US and 33 million worldwide. Of course, today they have a lot more because they did the major expansion uh, after that. But back then, that was the first time that Netflix ever funded a, a fully you know, independent show that belonged to the, to the network. Before that, they were just uh, paying other networks to use their content and, and share it online. 
So um, uh, they do have, uh, they, they did have like a, a movie of uh, uh, David Fincher, uh, the, the, the famous director, The Social Network. And basically a lot of, stu a lot of users ha had watched that and, and they liked it. Uh, also, they had several uh, movies uh, featuring like uh, uh, Kevin Spacey, and uh, uh, up to that point, they they were doing well uh, with uh, 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 with their viewings. And uh, and finally, they had the British version of House of Cards, which uh, was basically uh, a, a post Margaret Thatcher uh, uh, era, um, uh, similar like a show which was also based on the book. So it was referring back to the early 90s period of, of England. And that showed it very well at, in Netflix too. So basically Netflix uh, tried all different combinations of an existing show uh, with uh, different leading actors and with different directors. And they found that the, the, the combination of, uh, you know, of leading actor, uh, director and uh, existing show, it was this three, like David Fincher, Fincher, Kevin Spacey and House of Cards. And based on this, they decided to do a reboot of the uh, British, you know, uh, House of Cards for, you know, made for the US with uh, David Fincher as an executive uh, producer and director of some of the episodes and Kevin Spacey uh, as the leading actor. And as I said, that was one of the uh, successes back then. Uh, uh, for, for Netflix. So this is an example of how analytics they were used in order to identify uh, user uh, trends and user preferences in order to uh, actually produce an actionable uh, item and then you know put it to practice and, and see how it uh, how it works. Uh, yeah so this is basically um, the three area of analytics and here I would like to discuss uh, a little bit uh, a, a slide that is coming directly from uh, McKinsey's Global uh, Institute report. Uh, the report is called The Age of Analytics Competing in a Data-Driven World and it was posted in 2016. Uh, that was the second major uh, uh, report of McKinsey on analytics. The first one was published in 2011 and that actually triggered the, uh, the growth of the area over the uh, over this decade and in their last report they actually uh, estimated the potential benefits of uh, big data in uh, you know in, in transportation in different areas of transportation by the a by the by the year of 2025 right so uh, they separated that's one of the slides of course they talk about uh, all areas of analytics including healthcare government uh, uh, you know, retail, manufacturing, and and of course transportation. So over here, the uh, the benefits are uh, split in two categories: in consumer benefits and in public benefits pe benefits for society. So you can see that we have a lot of savings coming from um, uh, fewer need for fewer vehicles because uh, uh, because like uh, you know can use. Uh, uh, you know, you don't need to buy as many cars if you have a more efficient uh, way of using transportation, you know, as a service. Uh, less parking costs, uh, more a productive time during rides, especially with the connected uh, vehicles and, uh, you know, cars that they will use the data to uh, drive themselves and, uh, and then, you know, the drivers can do something more useful. Uh, less congestion and here you can see two estimates the, the dark estimate is the low range so for example for fewer vehicle purchases the savings are estimated to be between 330 uh, a billion to uh, uh, to to one trillion right and the white is the upper estimate uh, and and then we have uh, you know benefits for the society uh, which basically again uh, is we have reduced accidents and uh, reduced pollution from parking. So this is uh, basically a total estimate uh, of savings between like 840 billion to 2 trillion 530 billion 
by 2025, as McKinsey estimated, um, uh, you know, to be if the transportation sector takes full advantage of the existing, you know, big data technologies, predictive uh, technologies, and all everything else that has to do with data, right? Uh, and that's that's quite impressive, right? So uh, next, I would like to uh, talk a little bit more about technology, uh, a little bit about the internet, and uh, we we tend to talk about the internet, think about computers and cell phones, but today uh, we can think the following question: like, what do these uh, five items have in common? Like toilets, a dog house, a baby on sea. A, a matrix, a mattress cover, and an X ray. The the answer is that all these five items today can be connected to the internet, and it's it's crazy. But uh, all these there are different five products, and these are the the links. We have like toilets, baby onsies that they uh, monitor like the the baby's uh, heartbeat. Uh, we have like uh, dog houses connected to the internet. A matrix cover um, that they track the temperature of the body and all this stuff, and even egg trays, you know, that they tell you if your eggs are good, you know, in the fridge. Right. So it's not just uh, sensors and cell phones and computers and uh, iPads and and smart TVs connected to the internet. It's pretty much everything. So uh, it's crazy if we think uh, the volume of data that is being produced by these devices. And it's crazy to think uh, how many devices and how fast you know they, these you know these data is being gener generated per second, right? So I would like to um, go over this growth and talk a little bit about the, the technologies behind it. So over here you can see a graph showing uh, the, the growth of the devices uh, uh, that are connected to the internet over time. Uh, so uh, for example. Uh, you can see uh, that in 80, in 1982, uh, there were maybe one million items that they were mainly computers uh, connected uh, to some sort of network, which was the uh, precursor of, of of the internet. And then we start growing, and in 2009 we had the the term of Internet of Things. You know, it was born. So, and after that, you can see that. The, the growth has been exponential. So it is expected that along with everything we have in the house, by 2020, we'll have 50.1 billion devices, including, you know, uh, even your uh, the lock at your house will be connected to the internet. Your bottle uh, of, uh, of pills that you're taking from the doctor will be connected to the internet so that, you know, they can see if you took your pill or not. Uh, and it's expected to be 50.1 million billion. Um, now let's see what this means for, no, before that, let, let's see why this happened, right? So uh, it happened because uh, we have uh, faster computers, and this is what the left graphs is showing, like the evolution of computers from the 1970s until today. So on the, uh, on the left, uh, you know, that's a logarithmic scale, and I guess engineers will understand me that you know, a, a linear, linear increase in a logarithmic scale, this is an exponential increase in, uh, in the actual scale. So this means that uh, the, uh, the transistors that they were used in, in, in the processors that your computer uh, are using to run has been increasing exponentially nonstop from the 1970s uh, until today. On the other side, we have the, uh, the, the, the computer storage cost following a similar, uh, um, you know, uh, rule, but, you know, this time dropping, right? We, so basically from 2000, we have one gigabyte, you know, costing around $10 and 10 years later, the same, you know, gigabyte of storage uh, doesn't even cost, not even like a fraction of, uh, of a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. So this is also, you know, the same, same rule, but you know, downwards again, an exponential rule shows that um, the the storage has been dropping, you know, uh, constantly over time. Uh, if we wanted to explain how much data we have nowadays, 
and how much we're going to have by 2020, think about the following. Just think that you have um, uh, tablets, say iPads, right? And you basically start putting the data that we have in the world on these iPads, on, on the memory of the iPads. And let's take like uh, an iPad Air, which is basically 0.29 inch thick and it can fit up to 128 gigabyte and start putting data. And then once we're putting data, let's start stacking these iPads one on top of the other. Well, in 2013, if we would put, if we would store all the data of the world, uh, that would be equal to 4.4 zettabytes. But that means that we would be able to go from the Earth uh, more than half the distance to the Moon, like if we stack these iPads right one on top of the other. Now in 2020, you can see how many times we can go to the Moon and back with the data that we are predicting uh, to have. So we will have 6.6 .6 stacks as high as the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Right? This is how fast the data is growing in less than a decade. This is just a, a seven-year um, projection. Right? So this is this is what uh, how, how fast are the changes and how uh, big is the amount of data that in the future we need to uh, to deal with. So if we are to uh, basically uh, draw a graph and uh, basically put uh, um, the complexity of the analytics versus the data sophistication, we would see something like this. So the simplest way of analyzing data is like just, you know, reporting. And then we go to the, uh, to, to the analyzing, then to predicting, and then to the uh, applying the insights to an operation, and finally activating and having like automated decisions. So you see that analytics is not something that happens overnight, and it's not something that it's like one step process. It requires, you know, uh, good predictions are basically based on top of solid, you know, reporting systems and visualization systems and good like activations and good like automated uh, uh, tra transportation uh, processes are, are based on, you know, solid databases and which, you know, in terms is uh, based on solid like data storage and reporting. So. It's, it's a multi-layered layered process. Uh, the talent that it's necessary increases uh, as we're going like from simple reporting to making automated decision by using machine learning and uh, automatic like uh, 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 data analysis protocols. And it will definitely be a challenging um, area, you know, if we want to fully uh, benefit from you know uh, what analytics can offer to us uh, but at the same time uh, it's going to be a very beneficial one because it's going to change a lot of the things and it's going to be a, a very disrupting uh, technology with you know respect to how people do things uh, today so uh, with that being said I think I have concluded my part of presentation so maybe we can go back to uh, uh, to Bob's uh, part and, uh, and and go from there. Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to start off on the slide that you've just shown, Petros. We call that the beach ball diagram for obvious reasons. And uh, I, I, uh, I made a presentation on big data and analytics a few years ago at ITS America's annual meeting. And uh, a very senior guy from MOT, uh, sorry, from MIT, Joel Sussman, uh, asked me at the end of the presentation, this is all great, but what does it do in taking this towards automation? And it made me realize that we have a lot of discussion about autonomous vehicles and automatic uh, uh, vehicle technology, uh, but we really haven't started much of a discussion about the automated back office. And I think this slide shows uh, that perhaps we can start to make some steps towards uh, uh, automation in the back office as well. So let me go back up to slide five. Oh, 
There we go. So, uh, you know, building on what Petros has said, you know, he's uh, done a wonderful job of explaining some things that are happening in big data and analytics in the world beyond transportation. And uh, uh, the question now is, how is it relevant to transportation? How is it relevant to transportation system management operations? Obviously, in TSM and all, we've got to focus on congestion management. And the most effective way to do that is for us all to work together uh, towards a single set of objectives. So it would, regard, uh, it would relate to traffic incident management, traffic signal coordination, freeway management, uh, transit management, freight management, and management of all these things on a multimodal basis. Uh, so full spectrum from planning to maintenance, transportation is a single system. And I had the privilege uh, a few years ago to, to listen to Pamisano, who was then the chairman of IBM, uh, talk at the uh, another ITSM annual meeting in uh, Houston. And uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but he said, look, uh, business design Bob, we're having issues again hearing you. Um, I don't know what I can do about it. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now? right. It's good. Yeah, right. We can hear you now. Go on. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, he defined transportation with uh, four factors. One, uh, sorry, a system is having four factors. One, clarity of purpose. Uh, you know, we agreed on what it's trying to do. Uh, in this case of TSM and all, we're, we're trying to focus on uh, congestion management. Is it connected together? Are the essential elements joined up? Can we find out its status at any given time? And can it adapt to changes in the environment? Now, I would encourage you to take that little checklist and apply it to transportation. And I think you'll find that we're, we've made progress in some areas, but if you look at all four things in the checklist, or we really haven't started to deal with transportation as a single system yet. And of course, single system also includes alignment between planning, design, project delivery, uh, operations, and maintenance. Uh, and interestingly, I did some work with Caltrans uh, a few years ago, and they told me that they had about 400 planners and 4,000 engineers. So the, the importance of engineers and the importance of operations uh, is something that's uh, uh, has to be considered in all this. And then, you know, to, to try, and this may be a bit of an eye chart, but the slide uh, deck is available. These are the um, some examples of analytics that could be used for TSM and O. Uh, for example, in transportation management, we could define a mobility index, or maybe more appropriately, an, an accessibility index, which would measure how hard or how difficult it is to get from one part of the city to another. Uh, perhaps taking account of travel time, travel time variability, interchange time, and uh, the cost of travel as a proportion of household income. So there's a lot of analytics that can be used to improve our decision making right across the, the spectrum. And I'm deliberately just uh, cherry picking one to, to give you an example. The importance of operations, um, you know, uh, Petros mentioned this term a zettabyte. I have no idea what a zettabyte is, but I can tell you that uh, if we just extrapolate up from the, the data that's being generated by connected vehicles now, uh, or for the whole year for the US, it could be two zettabytes, you know, meaningless number. But if I tell you that in 2013, the World Wide Web generated four zettabytes, then we're talking about half the entire volume of the World Wide Web, which is a lot of data. Uh, also, a real example, the San Diego Association of Governments uh, on their integrated corridor management uh, project at one of the pioneer sites are generating a terabyte of data every day across uh, freeway, express lanes, transit, and arterial signals. And that could come up to about 200 terabytes per annum. Uh, I also wanted to make a point that, uh, that operations may have a new role in the future, and not just in terms of operating things, but maybe as the data stewards for or the, the rest of the transportation organization. Because uh, we have a, a, a strong suspicion that most of the data uh, coming into a transportation agency will come through operations. And uh, you know, just to provoke you, I've given you some uh, thoughts about what proportion of data originating from. 
the different uh, departments would be planning design project delivery operations and maintenance. Uh, I to tell you, I just made these numbers up. Uh, I would love to uh, to work with agencies to actually get some uh, real numbers about the portion and the size and volumes of data uh, coming from each department. Uh, I did some work uh, with the uh, uh, University of Maryland on uh, a course for transportation system management operations. And based on what people told me, their problems were and issues and challenges, uh, I came up with these 12 youth cases, uh, 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 descriptions that can be used to uh, apply to, uh, to transportation operations and management. Uh, a use case is something that kind of captures what is you're trying to do. Uh, how big data and analytics can be used to solve issues. It captures the issues, captures the problem, if you like, uh, captures the analytics to be used, the data to be used, and also the value proposition, what we're trying to get out of, out of it in terms of safety, efficiency, and enhanced user experience. And then uh, I'd all like to kind of round up by talking about smart data management. The whole idea of data coming from multiple sources, being streamlined into a central repository, conducting analytics on that repository, and then being able to distribute the data and the analytics to the appropriate people. But I also want to recognize that there is also such a thing as not so smart data management, uh, where you have uh, data silos and what I would call data cockpits. Uh, a data cockpit is uh, where data has been brought together but being brought together for the use of a specific person in the organization or for a specific group or job description. Uh, we believe that analytics can not only uh, be amazing decision support, uh, but could eventually help to shape the organization uh, when you start to set uh, job objectives and job descriptions based on the achievement of certain levels that are prescribed by the analytics. So uh, that uh, concludes it. I'm sorry we did it in reverse order, but I think it works either way, uh, where Petros has given you the analytics from the wider perspective, and I've tried to show how it can be used for uh, transportation system management and operations. So I'll hand back to Nilo now. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that was a great presentation from both of you. Um, <clears throat> so. As a reminder again, uh, please put in any questions or comments you have in the question discussion pod here. I see the first question in here, and I know we have an initial answer, but I'll just ask to see if there are any, any additional thoughts. So uh, Ken Yang has asked, do you know what visualization tool to be used to create this NYC heat map? Uh, yeah, in fact, it was an internal tool from uh, Foursquare. Uh, but it was also uh, you know, developed about five years ago, so there are better uh, open source tools available and also better proprietary tools. So uh, one example would be Quick.com, Q-L-I-K, uh, an example of a, a business intelligence and visualization tool. Thanks, Bob. Um, so question about workforce in the like big data and data scientist field of work. So uh, the question is like, do you see a need in that area? And if yes, like what are the skills that are needed? Is it more uh, like statistics and programming? Or is it important to have some transportation knowledge? Like what is the balance between having those two skills in, in these types of work? Well, as uh, Petros is an analytics guy, I'm sure he will say you've got to understand analytics and statistics. As a transportation guy, I would say you need to understand transportation, so maybe there's a need to build a bridge between the two. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, there may not be too many transportation agencies where the analytics skills exist right now. If we go talk to a, a big private company, they typically have a team of, of analysts who will work with the tools. So I think we have to address workforce development, and we have to look to ways to um, uh, to grow this capability inside transportation agencies. Uh, and of course, there's a vital role for consultants in providing the initial support uh, until the local agencies get up to speed. So Petros, okay. you want to add anything? And if I can comment on that, uh, uh, so the important thing, like if 
uh, a manager wants to implement analytics for their everyday operations, it's important to understand what analytics can and what analytics cannot do for their organization in order to avoid wasting you know, time acquiring you know, technologies that they might not use and uh, basically do things better. So I would say that, uh, yes, if you want to be an engineer doing the thing and a data analyst, you need to know uh, programming skills like Python, R, and mathematics like statistics, operations, research, uh, being good at calculus and, uh, and linear algebra. But if you just want to uh, implement the analytics in your organization, you can obviously uh, subcontract companies who do the analytics, but it is essential to understand what is the problem that you are trying to solve and what is that you're trying to improve and if the data that you're collecting is the right data and uh, if you know uh, and if the, the engineers will be able to uh, to do what what you want to do. So I would say that, at the high level, is more of understanding what analytics can do for you rather than actually uh, implementing them. And uh, I think it would be useful to to treat this as both a threat and an opportunity. Um, you know, in terms of the opportunity, there's obviously uh, it, it's possible to go from data to information to insight to action. Uh, in terms of a, a threat, uh, you know, people that travel are not just our customers; they're customers of Netflix, Southwest Airlines, FedEx. And all these companies are using advanced analytics to raise the quality of the user experience. And uh, that, that would be the reasons why you would uh, do this. Uh, there might also be a question in your mind about you know, what's the difference between analytics and reporting. Uh, and I would put it to you this way. If you're um, uh, doing reporting and you uh, think of yourself as a spectator at a football game, uh, then you're probably only ever going to be the most well-informed spectator. Uh, but if you use analytics appropriately, you can actually become the coach and start to change the performance of the team. Yeah, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions, please type up. I'll ask another question that I had. Uh, so again, with the issue of big data and data collection, uh, especially in the transportation and with public agencies using different equipments or cameras for collecting those data. Uh, yeah. Some people have concerns, concerns of privacy and, uh, you know, how those like public agencies are using those data. Uh, you know, the transportation professionals would say like this would make the system so much more efficient uh, mm -hmm. the con so much better, but on the other hand, obviously there is the privacy issue. So, have you ever had this problem, or do you? What is your take on this? Well, I, I think it's very important to address data governance uh, when you're trying to use data, big data and analytics. Uh, you know, we've seen some organizations kind of reversing into the situation, and then having some issues about privacy, access control, and also management of the data set. Uh, uh, there also is a kind of um, uh, perhaps a growing realization that, that privacy really needs to be managed very carefully because if you put enough different data sets together, uh, you may be able to get around some of the privacy constraints that are in place. And it's very, open, very valuable, very necessary, in fact, that your data governance takes that into account and, uh, and, and manages it. I would also say that uh, you know, from a data point of view, you know, several people have asked me, how do we start building a data lake? And I think the first thing you have to do is stop throwing the data away. I've talked to some agencies who see data as a, a liability you know, from a legal point of view and from a cost point of view. And I think you're missing a huge opportunity to take the data, bring it together, and then un get more insight and understanding. And we quite expect that if you do that, you probably come up against what we call a wow moment and a whoops moment. Uh, the wow moment will be when you see a pattern, a connection, a relationship that you didn't see. 
And then the, the whoops moment is you may well see a, a deficiency or a weakness in your current service delivery for transportation. We don't see the whoops moment as the end of the world because a rational response to understanding a new problem is to put a plan in place to fix it and get a budget. And we call that results-driven investment planning, where you're actually investing uh, based on a fairly well-defined uh, uh, objective or outcome. Thanks, Bob. Anything to add? And I, would, I would like to. Yeah, I would like to add to that that uh, uh, nowadays, like the the laws and the legislation that we have, uh, I would say uh, it, it it hasn't. Uh, yet catch up with, uh, with, the, with the technological advancements. So the existing uh, uh, laws, they are basically focusing on uh, putting the rules on the data collection and they are not uh, very much concerned about the malicious data user, usage. For example, when uh, we have, for example, some medical data, we have very strict protocols about how they can be uh, stored in a medical database and who can have access to them. But on the other side, if somebody can, uh, you know, uh, use open data from the internet to stalk a user and, uh, you know, uh, uh, give them services or, you know, uh, do something malicious to them, this is something that is not penalized. So I would say that we need to see a shift uh, more from, uh, uh, you know, legislature of how to collect data we need to see stuff as to, you know, uh, penalizing the malicious data usage and, uh, you know, uh, actually care about how, what somebody does with the data rather than how they collected it. Yeah, like uh, like most laws, uh, you know, perhaps they, uh, uh, you know, the probability of being caught and the consequences of uh, you being caught way, way in terms of whether you do something wrong or not. So Neil, uh, I've heard a lot of people talking about data as the new oil, and uh, I really like that analogy because the crude oil, when it comes out of the ground, is dirty, smelly, and nobody wants to deal with it, and it doesn't really, you know, have, have the value that it has when it's being refined into products like gasoline and diesel and heating oil. So uh, I think that's the way I would look at data, that uh, it has a low value until you turn it in from, into information. Uh, get some new insight and understanding, and then develop response strategies and develop TSM and O strategies on the basis of the the new insight, the new understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate both of your perspectives um, and also your presentations. Uh, so we are reaching the end of the webinar. Any last thoughts before I end the webinar? No, uh, I think we'd offer a challenge back to the audience, you know, do you know what your data is up to right now and uh, do you have some kind of idea of how much data is being generated from the various departments? We'd love to, to work with you to find out a bit more about that. Great, yeah. Um, so I guess I really want to thank again all the panelists here and also uh, all the attendees uh, bearing with us through this webinar. Uh, some great information was changed, exchanged. Um, again, this webinar was recorded and uh, the slides and the video of the webinar will be shared with you. On behalf of the National Operations Center of Excellence and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thank you so much.